Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. Welcome to Think Tech. This show is center stage. We are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, uh, which is also very near Kumukuhue Theater, where I am the managing director. I want to let you know that here at Think Tech, we broadcast our, show, broadcast our shows live every weekday from noon to five. You can catch our shows right here, uh, wherever you are watching us now, uh, thinktechhawaii.com, and all of our shows are archived on YouTube. You can catch them there. My guest here on Center Stage today is R. Kevin Doyle. R. Kevin Doyle is the director of school, uh, director of the School of the Arts at Mid Pacific Institute. He's also in an improvisation band called Oil in the Alley, and he is a director in the Shakespeare, the Honolulu Shakespeare Festival this year. We're going to talk about all of that and more. Welcome, R. Thank you for Thank being you so here. much for having me. This is awesome that I get to just sit you down for 45 minutes, <laughs> and we're going to, <laughs> we're, I'm going to learn all about you. It's the longest I'll have been sitting still in a while, so good. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Well, I'm glad to, I think, do that for you, unless, like, you're severely ADD. No, I'm all right. I'm all okay. right. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so let's talk about what things you have going on right now, because you have a lot. Yeah, you know, it's just it's a busy time of year. Uh, in addition to Oil in the Alley and the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival, I'm also very active with On the Spot uh, Improv with uh, Garrick Paikai and Elisa Joy Lee. And we're getting ready to start uh, the application process for the Improv Festival on Friday. So, uh, oh, for Improv again. Yeah, for, so Garrick's been much more busy with that than I have, but we have a lot of things, uh, all of us have a lot of things on our mind between the festival auditions this Saturday and the, the uh, application process starting on Friday and and also I'm working on a Midsummer Night's Dream project that's going to be touring some of the high schools and middle schools so it's been a, it's been a busy couple of weeks here yeah <laughs> so. I guess so okay so let's break these things sure. down a little bit let's talk about Midsummer Night's Dream first. okay that is through Mid Pacific. Uh, that's actually through the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival. Oh. Uh, last year, Lacey Chu, in conjunction with Tony Pisculli, Tony, of course, is the uh, director of the Shakespeare Festival, started doing touring shows. So this is actually the third touring show. They're small cast shows. It's a four-person, 45, 50-minute version of Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's going to be touring to uh, the different high schools and middle schools that have booked it for the rest of this month. So mm -hmm. cast of four, Lacey Chu, uh, adapted the play down to about 50 minutes, and uh, it'll be it's, it's fun. It's a lot of a uh, lot of fun. She she only kept the good stuff, oh. so none of the none of that lousy Shakespeare stuff. Just the fun <laughs> just the Shakespeare stuff. stuff so. uh, she adapted the script, yeah. and you directed it. I'm directing it. Yeah. You directed uh, Moses Goods, uh, Nick Adabuccio, and I hope I said your name right, Nick. And Kyle uh, Scholl and Lacey are the three or the four performers in the show. Oh, okay. So they're playing all the characters. Awesome. And who, uh, how did you go through the booking for the schools? How did you uh, Lacey Chu is the person who does that. Lacey, this is a, you know, one of the things I think that the Shakespeare Festival uh, has been working towards is this idea of greater community outreach. And Lacey sort of picked up the gauntlet on her own and created this program. So, well, just like I said, this is the third one they've had touring, and it's very exciting to me, uh, somebody who was part of the founding of the festival, to see the festival coming around to a more year-round uh, structure than the six weeks in summer structure that we've had for the last 14 years. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think Shakespeare, a lot of people think that it's so unapproachable and you yep. have to have an education before you can even get to it. And it's, yep. it's not, it's fun and it's silly and it's pugilism. Oh yeah, and, oh yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is that there's like two different camps about Shakespeare. There's one camp that is exactly as you described it, but I think there's also another camp that expects a certain level of boredom and is actually disappointed if it's not boring. Because oh. uh, I've, I've gotten that sometimes, oh, that was too funny. I was laughing too much during that during that scene, you know. So it's like, well, you know, I'm I'm sorry you were having a good time, <laughs> but uh, you know. So I think that it's uh, it's it's a challenge. Shakespeare is always a challenge in that way. Is you can't please everyone, so you just yeah. have to approach it like it's good theater and try to make it interesting for yourself. Yeah. Well, and I like the idea of cutting it down to take it to a school yeah. and. Give it something that uh, everybody, all of the kids, can absorb pretty easily. That's, that's the hope, of course. I'm, I, I have a friend who you just reminded me will go see a Shakespeare show, and she will take a little script along with her, and she'll read along with it. 
and she expects it to all be there. And yeah. she, you know, she'll notice if someone doesn't have their lines, but that's not what she's, why she is doing it. She's just a very visual, word-oriented yep. person. So, yeah, there's another... But, yeah. yeah, because there, there's, it's studied in English class as much as it is in theater class. So there's a, there's a strong feeling that it's primarily a literary form to many people. And, of course, it was never originally intended to be presented in a written format. That didn't happen until years after his death. Uh, so it's meant to be seen and heard more than it's meant to be read. The reading it is good, too. You should read it. But <laughs> that's not the only reason to do it. Yeah. Okay, so that kicks off tomorrow, did you say? Yeah, that's tomorrow we have our preview of that, and then uh, the tour actually starts in earnest next week. And you have one public performance people can yeah, go see? Yeah, uh, I believe it's Saturday the 18th, if Saturday is in fact the 18th, of this month at Bishop Museum, and there's information about that online at the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival webpage, hawaiishakes.org. Hawaiishakes.org, yeah. okay. And how long have you been in rehearsals with these four people? Uh, since January. We had auditions in, I think, late November, early December, and then uh, we went right into rehearsals in January. Uh, you know, this is, this is a real different experience for me. These, all of them are getting paid. Uh, usually the Shakespeare Festival is a volunteer system, like most of our community theaters. And uh, so having four people that are, are basically hired uh, to perform, they have a different level of expectation of themselves uh, because they're being treated like professionals here. So they're, uh, they're great. I mean, it's really been a, a joy working with them. I mean, everybody was off book immediately and, uh, and yeah, it's just really been a great working situation. Oh, so, so yeah, terrific. One of the best experiences I've had. Oh, very cool. Yeah. What, uh, do you have any unique challenges along with that? Well, you know, the main thing is is that uh, there's they're playing multiple characters. So Kyle, for example, is playing uh, Hermia and Puck and uh, Lion, Peter uh, Snug the Joiner in the mechanical sequence. So she's playing four, three characters, and frequently she has to change literally on stage immediately from one to the other. Like she has to walk forward as Puck and turn into her Hermia mid, mid walk. And uh, so that's been an interesting challenge. But you know, a few months back, there was a show that played over at uh, Orvis, I think, at the university called the, I think it was called the Guru of Chai. This, uh, I think it was. I saw that, saw that, that was yeah? amazing. And he did these yeah. amazing character changes and all of us saw it. Uh, so that was a influence on how we ended up approaching some of the changes here. You know, you have to, when you see really good theater, you, it's really useful to watch it and say, what are things from this that uh, can be borrowed and used again? Yeah. And his ability to transform from one character to another uh, certainly influenced the way we approached this particular show. Oh yeah, that guy was amazing. How he Fabulous. Would just, he would, it, he wouldn't just slide from one character to another. He he locked in place. Oh yeah, it was but, remarkable, yeah. remarkable. And uh, I I don't know that uh, you know he's been doing that show for five ten years now. So we're not going to be at that level after three months. <laughs> but the, the performers are doing a very good job of reaching uh, reaching a really crisp, clear uh, characterization for each of the characters oh, that they're playing. Awesome. Yeah, that's, so that's been the major challenge is figuring out the staging for these instant changes. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the framing story had to be eliminated. So instead of this whole thing about this Theseus's wedding and now they're running into the woods and we take care of all of that in a little opening monologue uh, and then we're in the woods right away. And so, you know, making it make sense with 45 minutes of a three hour play uh, is, is a challenge, but yeah. it's certainly something that when you have good enough performers, you can communicate effectively. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. I want to see it. Um, and you just recently had a performance of, for uh, Oil in the Alley. Yeah, uh, we've been performing at okay. Downbeat Diner uh, for the last on and off for the last year or so. We've had a bunch of different venues, and so far this has been one that has uh, suited us best other than uh, Laugh Track Theater, which is where we started. Laugh Track was the, the ultimate uh, performance venue for us, but since that's no longer around, uh, we've been you know kind of searching for different places to do our show, and Downbeat's been terrific. Uh, to, uh, the, hearing the lyric, we improvise our lyrics, so having the audience 
uh, have the ability to actually understand what we're saying is vital for the show to work as an improv show. Otherwise, it's just a, a, a bar concert. Mm -hmm. uh, and Downbeat, I think, is the first place that's really been able to really effectively get our lyrics out there. Uh, and that's really important to making the show work. Oh, yeah. So we're performing there again, I believe, in May, but I can't remember the date off the top of my head for that. But we'll be there in May. So talk, if you would, please describe sure. what Oil in the Alley is. Uh, Oil in the Alley is a, now a four-person rock band. Uh, we created a little bit of a backstory for ourselves. The band is Sean O'Malley, Brian S. Smith, and Dan Cutter. And basically, uh, the idea was we were huge in the late 80s and early 90s. We suffered an acrimonious breakup, and now we're back. And uh, everybody in the audience is our super fan. We treat them like they're our super fans, and uh, we ask them to, uh, without saying we want you to be our super fans, we ask them to behave like our super fans. And by doing that, uh, I think we hopefully create a kind of an interesting interactive experience for them where they're seeing their favorite band ever yeah. and uh, hearing their favorite songs ever. And uh, yeah, it's been really a, a fun bunch of years. Sean and I started it, gosh, four or five years ago now. Uh, O'Malley and I have worked together since 89, 90, uh, in different forms with the improv group Loose Screws and then now with uh, Oil in the Alley. So he and I have been uh, in each other's faces for you know well over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it shows on stage, I think. It I think does. That, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to watch. And you improv, improvise all of your songs. All of the songs. The, now, the music is not improvised. The music is set. We improvise the lyrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, so if you came to see our show multiple times, things might start sounding a little familiar to you, but you're never going to hear the lyrics the same way twice. And we have now, you know, we've developed a number of songs over the years. We probably have, uh, you know, any given show we do six or seven songs, and we have about 12 or 13 that we pull from, and another four or five that we've retired or, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, just aren't interested in doing anymore. So yeah, we have a, we have a bunch of different, so the concert feels different, we hope, every time we do it. Uh, you know, we, uh, we had seen a bunch of groups doing improv music over the years. And the problem a lot of times with an improvised music act when they're doing multiple songs is that the songs all start to sound alike. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really important to us as we went into creating a rock band that the songs all had their own identity and personality. So we're able to identify the song kind of by its personality. Like we have one called Pseudo Brian Adams, which is meant to feel like a Brian Adams song. Uh, Sean would say Brian Adams by the way of, uh, by a, another artist, but, uh, my, my point is is that when we perform it, we perform it with an attitude that we imagine is consistent with Brian Adams. So the Brian Adams song has kind of a cockiness to it and a, and you know, a, oh, we're rock stars attitude towards it, as opposed to another song that we have that, uh, I'm trying to remember what we call it, but uh, it's much darker and you know, we get into a different mood when we're performing it. And see, so it's, it's uh, we want the songs to have different personalities, and the best way to do that was to have really tightly rehearsed, specifically written songs, and then invent the lyrics then you to just do all the time. The yeah. So if we're doing the dark song and the lyrics and, and the suggestion from the audience is like, you know, fuzzy warm puppies, we're doing a dark brooding song about fuzzy warm puppies, yeah? And that's part of the fun of it is that the, based on what we pull from the audience, uh, the songs take on a different identity anytime they're performed. Oh, yeah. Okay, we gotta take a break. Sure. Uh, we will be right back. We're talking with our Kevin Doyle. I'm Donna Blanchard. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series, and we'll see you in a second or two. <laughs> Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between four and five o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, 
vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Hi, we're back and we're live. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series. I'm Donna Blanchard and I'm talking with our Kevin Doyle. We're just discussing Oil in the Alley, which is an improvisational rock band. Yeah. That's a really unique experience. It's a lot of fun. I can I can vouch for that. I've seen that. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's tight, too. Yeah. Uh, now, now who, who are the other two guys? Uh, Brian Smith is our bass player, and uh, Bry X is how he goes on stage. And uh, Dan Cutter is our drummer right now. Oh. Uh, Dan's the best singer of the group, and uh, Bry is the, the one who keeps us true to music, because Bry is uh, was a, he was a real musician. I mean, not that Sean and Dan, Sean and Dan are real musicians, too, but Brian made a go of the rock career for a little while uh -huh. so he's a he's a lawyer now but for a while he was uh, he was in a number of bands that had uh, a small amount of success in their areas here and that you know, honestly a small amount of success is a huge amount of success in the rock world here so he, he keeps us true to our rock roots as much as possible every time we start drifting a little bit too much towards Duran Duran he pulls us back towards <laughs> Motley Crue so <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> And you said that you are about to introduce your second album. Yeah, you know, uh, we've, <laughs> we, uh, we have two albums. We're on iTunes. Uh, but uh, the first album was recordings from our laugh track show. So that's all acoustic. Back then it was just Sean and I. And Sean would play guitar and I, we would both sing. Uh, like it was our unplugged version of the show. And uh, we've done uh, KQH Monday Night Live a couple of times now. The most recent time we performed there, uh, we rec uh, they recorded everything in the KQH studio, and that's being mixed right now into an album. And I, I put it in quotes just because uh, it's it's so weird to me to think that there's an album out even if you know all of nine people will probably buy it in all of history it's fun that it's there it's fun to be able to say we're on iTunes and on Reverb Nation and uh, you know yeah. so that's it's good fun for us you know none of our videos have had more than like 500 hits or so so it's uh, but it's still 500 that's hits is exciting yeah <laughs> it's very exciting uh, yeah and getting past that 300 mark on YouTube yeah. there's some you know about that. Oh, I didn't then, know like, about that. You could just click on a video and watch it for a little while, and it'll count as a view up yeah. until 300. Then they start taking you seriously, and oh, you really have to watch. People really have to watch the that whole thing. Video. Oh, fascinating! Yeah. I did not know that. I don't know why. Well, I'm I know much that. more impressed now that we have over 500. You on should a be. Of them. Okay, it's well, big. Good. It's big. <laughs> okay, so you, if you're at KTUH doing the songs, how are you getting the material? Well, for that? we had a bunch of different ways of doing that. One way, uh, well, the way that we rehearse is I pull things off of people's Facebook comments. So oh. when we're rehearsing, I'll just scroll through my Facebook wall and I'll look for an uh, interesting phrase that might be fun out of context and we'll make that a song title. And, uh, and so I'll, we'll do a song based on that. What we did at KTUH is one, we've been, been there twice. Once we set up a phone number, people could call in uh, and tech, or actually text in memories of the band and then from the memory of the band we'd do the same thing we'd scan looking for something that sounded like it was a fun song title uh, we uh, we do what Sean calls invisible improv which means that instead of saying hey could we get a suggestion for this we interact with the audience we listen to what they're saying or we look at what they're wearing we say oh we, I see you're wearing a, a turtle necklace uh, does that have any special meaning to you? And then uh, if you said something about that that we found interesting, we'd pull that and make that the title of the song. So a similar thing when we were oh, at KQH. Okay. We'd pull it from memories people had of watching the band perform. Uh, but, you know, if somebody wrote down, you know, I was watching you sing scuba diving while I was drinking a cojita or something, we're not going <laughs> to pick scuba diving. We're probably going to pick Cojita is the title, for example. It's so. a lot more fun to sing. It's, it's more fun. Well, it's more fun to sing, but also <laughs> uh, we have this thing about we we uh, long ago we decided we weren't going to play requests. So you know, no matter what title somebody yells up, we're not going to play a song because they yelled the title. We're going to get the suggestion in some other way, uh, just because. Uh, 
you know, we want to do as much as we can to maintain the interaction aspect of it. And if you start developing a system where people feel like if they yell a title, you're going to perform a title, you somewhat create an atmosphere where it's harder to interact with people mm -hmm. because then they're just going to start yelling things out. Oh, yeah, oh. Uh, Which is fine for different kinds of shows, uh, but for this particular show, that's not what we want. We want a show where uh, there's more uh, interaction than just, I'm yelling up, free bird, play free bird. Uh, we might play a song called Play Free Bird, but we're not going to play Free Bird. There you go. <laughs> And it really is pretty seamless. It's a lot of fun watching yeah. you guys. Well, you know, and it's something that's very consistent with the way we uh, we do improvisation in Hawaii in general. Uh, certainly in the, the world Garrick and Elisa and I are in uh, that's developed out of some of the stuff Loose Screws did, and Garrick has really taken the ball and run with it. Uh, you know, we don't always take a suggestion the way that, we don't always say, oh, give us a name of this. Uh, we'll do that when we do some of our shows. Like, we do a show every Wednesday night at the We're Arts. We're talking about On the Spot. Now. Yeah, On the Spot. I'm talking about On the Spot right now. Uh, but, you know, when Garrick created his silent movie show or uh, his Telltale Dreadful show, the way we would get the suggestion had more to do with the feeling of... Uh, of how it felt interacting with the audience. Like Garrick would make eye contact with someone for a while and if they looked a certain way, he would adopt that into his body and that would become the, the way that the show started. So, uh, you know, finding ways to make the connection with the audience more meaningful than just, hey, give us three funny things that you heard on the bus today uh, has been uh, important to us. Which, yeah. I mean, and that's, uh, Asking for it by saying, give us three funny things you heard on the bus, totally acceptable, totally fine. It's just different shows of our benefit from different ways of interacting with the audience. And so that's been something that we've experimented a lot with out here yeah. in all of the different improv worlds that I'm, I've been traveling in. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, on the spot, and I haven't had an opportunity to see on the spot. Oh! Um, uh, are you? Is it usually? Is the? Are you performing uh, for a half hour well, from one on idea? Uh, depends on the uh, Depends on the show. You know, we do all kinds of things. Our Wednesday night show right now is called the Throwdown, and it's uh, actually we're going to be doing it tonight. And uh, the Throwdown is a competitive improv show. Usually, we have uh, several improvisers that we refer to as iron improvisers, and they're like iron chefs, and they're the ones that perform with us on a more regular basis. Uh, and then we have a guest that will come in and. Any given week, and it's a two-on-two -two competition. I'm making the Spock sign to do two-on-two. -two. Uh, it's a two-on-two -two competition, uh, but we'll do short-form games like Whose Line Is It Anyway style games uh, that existed long before Whose Line Is It Anyways did, and some games of that we invented, and uh, and we'll let the audience decide who won any given round. And they, I mean, this is a fake competition, but it, the competition gives a sense of a story to it. Yeah. Storytelling is really important to, to on the spot, uh, whether we're doing a short form show or a long form show, we want it to feel, people to feel like there's a, there's a story progression they heard. Our students are actually doing a show Saturday night uh, that's based on the structure of like the vacation movies, the idea of uh, the family vacation that transforms the family somehow. And that's gonna be at the arts uh, on Saturday, I think at eight, I'd have, I don't, remember the time exactly here but uh, yeah we're we're very excited about that we've been teaching this thing called project genre for several years where we take a group of improvisers and we teach them how to improvise a story in a specific style so uh, yeah story and style those are oh. the things we like to really focus in on uh, and that's been a lot of fun and it's taken us to a lot of cool places you know we've Garrick uh, Garrick and guys have gone to Phoenix, Austin, Chicago, Seattle. I've gone with them to Los Angeles and Seattle and Chicago. And so it's really the, the kind of improv that he spearheaded is something that's, uh, I, I think has become very influential outside of Hawaii also. Uh, we're in demand. We have a, we do an improvised kabuki show that we've been asked to apply to three or four different mainland festivals since we've brought it back. Uh, I don't know that we can bring it to anything, but it's been exciting to see that people are still so interested in that show after all these years. Yeah. Oh, okay, so your Wednesday night show, The yeah. Throwdown, yep. starts at what time? 7.30 and it's free. So 7.30 The Arts, it's free. Okay. So and that's uh, 
rest of this month and certainly some into May uh, and maybe into the summer depending on the needs of the arts. The arts, of course, as a co-op, schedules other things sometimes based on the needs of their members. Uh, okay. So to find out about that, uh, Arts uh, and Marks? Uh, you could go to the Arts and Marks Garage site or to any of the on-the-spot sites. Either If you look for on-the-spot improv on Facebook, there's lots of information about what's happening with on-the-spot. On-the-spot improv. And there's, a, I believe, the web page is otsimprov.com or .org. I can't remember if it's a .com or .org. <laughs> Sorry, Garrick. <laughs> um, and uh, the Arts at Marks is a .org. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, cool. That uh, you're, that's the f that's the Wednesday show. The yeah, Saturday yeah. show. The Saturday show coming up is our students doing vacation, a vacation movie sort of thing. So that should be really exciting too. Yeah, and that starts at what time? I think that know? starts at eight. I'm actually somewhere else that night, so uh, so <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to actually be there myself. But I've been involved in getting the students ready to get the show up. It's it's a good group of students, and the, I think the show is going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Cool. That sounds like fun, too. And, um, well, the Arts at Marks is, you do a lot of work there now. I do a lot of work at the Arts, yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm friends with two different partners, so I'm well, actually with many different partners, so I find myself, the Arts has kind of become my home, my arts, artistic home for the last bunch of years. Awesome. And they have a newsletter that it, you just get on the yeah. newsletter list. And yeah. That's, you, it's you a great space, everything. and it's exciting that there's been a co-op in Hawaii that's been uh, around and as active as long as they've been. So hooray for the arts. Yeah, they do an amazing job. And just got a nice little facelift. Yeah, and it looks great. The chairs are great. They fixed the window. Uh, the, the cubicle, there's more space in there. Stop by the arts. It looks great. Yeah. Well, and they always <laughs> have an art exhibit. In yeah. There. So yeah. the lobby is an art exhibit so, yeah. and, and a bar. It, it sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes in the evening there's a bar. <laughs> Not at two in the afternoon, but I mean when well, there's events, yeah, there's that's usually right. events. They yeah. set a bar there. When there are events. <laughs> um, let's go to our second break, and then sure. we'll come back, and we're, I would like to talk about what's going on at Mid-Pacific Institute sure. next. We'll shift over into that. Okay? Fabulous. Um, so we will be right back. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series, and we're talking to our Kevin Doyle. Be back in a few. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel, I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes, there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table, being discussed, that will affect us all going forward. So uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, welcome back. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series. I want to let you know that if you are interested in being in our studio audience for any of the Think Tech shows, you should contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. That's J-A-Y at thinktechhawaii.com. I'm Donna Blanche, you're talking with our Kevin Doyle, and we were just over the break, we did a no-no, and we started <laughs> having a conversation off air that 
um, I, I made you stop because I said, I we're talking about your auditions yeah. coming up, and I had just been speaking in front of a group of people at the Hawaii Sketch uh, Comedy Festival saying, I personally feel that an, uh, as an actor, an audition is an audition is for me. Yeah. It's, it's my opportunity to try things out, to yep. be seen, to get to know other people in the area, to watch, to, um, you know, uh, you learn about a director when you yep. ask them questions. Absolutely. You learn a lot about the director in that situation. As a director, I enjoy the audition process. Yep. Um, I always try to make it as comfortable as possible, but insistent. Yep. You know, because you have a lot to learn. And and, yep. and, and one thing that I said on Sunday was, I'm, I'm watching you from the moment you walk in the door. Oh, yeah. You know, play nice with the other kids oh, yeah. or you're out. You snicker yeah. at someone in a, you know, in a mean way. I, yeah. I'm not going to cast you. Yeah. So, and what did you say about auditions? <laughs> oh, I hate auditions. I hate the whole <laughs> audition process. Uh, I find them to be very... Uh, I found them to be humiliating to everyone involved. And part of that is because there is a sense of uh, mutual judgment going on. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's, I mean, uh, this is almost the same as like with a job interview. There's, everyone is so focused on putting their best foot forward that it's very hard to make a connection with the actual human uh, that's involved in the, in the performance or in the audition here. Uh, you know, uh, I've tried to do a lot of things to minimize that in my own way of auditioning things. Like when I'm on my own, like when we do, I do callbacks for the Shakespeare Festival, I turn it more into an interview style, one-on-one -on -one thing than into a big group thing. Because I think that strips away some of the, I have to put on, I have to put this on because I'm in front of a lot of different people, uh, thing that both, that both I do and that I think actors sometimes do. Uh, but you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's 30 seconds to two minutes and you know, we're expecting somebody who's often never seen this piece of text before to get up there and show us something. And uh, you know, it's, it's a lot, uh, it, it's challenging to make good casting decisions off of that. I've had better luck uh, watching a bunch of shows, seeing people that work well, and ultimately after working with people over a number of years, developing relationships that, that, um, that are effective and that allow you to, to do good work. I mean, I've worked with, to give an example, I've worked with Alvin Chan probably 15 times over the past bunch of years, and I know Alvin's talent level and I know his ability to interpret something, and if Alvin shows up at an audition, I'm, I'm certainly gonna offer him something just because I know how, how talented he is and how hard he works. Uh, that's a that's not a message for you, Alvin. But it is. <laughs> but but it is. But 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 my point is and that's true of other people also. But I'm using Alvin as an example because he was one of my students at Mid Pacific years ago. So oh. he's he's easy to use as an example. Uh, but you know that's uh, it's it's just so hard with uh, an audition to uh, to not leave. I feel like for a lot of actors, it's hard to leave an audition feeling good. You know, I think a lot of people just leave an audition feeling like, well, what did I do? That was, I was here for three hours. They watched me for five minutes. How is that in any way indicative of my ability as a performer? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard way to judge people uh, or to select people. Uh, and I, I do the same thing you do. I mean, I tell people right from the beginning, everything they do is something that we're watching because part of it, especially in a community situation where uh, everyone is a volunteer, you have to spend eight weeks with people and uh, they need to figure out whether you as a director or somebody they want to spend time with. And you know, you need to figure out if you want to spend time with them oh, yeah. or if you think that they're going to come in and they're a great actor, but you know, if you hear through the grapevine that there's somebody that's been disruptive uh, it's it's small, such a small community, and it's uh, uh, you know it's it's uh, anyhow. I guess my point is I don't like auditions. Okay, uh, but if you come to the auditions, I'll try to make you feel as comfortable as I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I think it's good to see, and maybe this is why I like some reality yeah. shows, is because I think it's good to see people under that kind of crazy pressure. Yeah. And I find it very enlivening as an actor. I yeah. remember the first audition I went to on the island was the for the Vagina Monologues oh, last okay. year. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't auditioned in years, so I kind of felt that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've done this a lot before, but I still felt the like excitement yeah. slash nerves, all the same things firing off. 
And I left there and just went, oh my God, that felt great. Yeah. It felt so good to do that. I wonder if part of my antipathy, if I'm using that word correctly, to uh, auditions has to do with uh, some of my improv work. Uh, you know, when you do improv, you usually work with the same group of people. I've worked with Garrick and Elisa for in different combinations for you know 10, 10 15 years now and uh, you know anything I do I'd always choose them first for anything because they're they're my partners in a lot of ways and uh, there's a, that sense of mutual trust already there's a sense that we're all aware of each other's needs and each other's boundaries and uh, or lack of boundaries and uh, and that's, uh, that makes a big difference when you're performing uh, or you're working with people. And that, so that might be part of it also, is I just realized that when you have that really tight working relationship with a group of people already, yeah. you, you, there's a lot of shorthand uh, that you can use. There's a lot of shortcuts you can take. You don't have to build the relationship if the relationship's already there. Yeah. Just like you don't, if you cast somebody who can already understand Shakespeare's language, you don't have to teach them Shakespeare's language. And while not knowing Shakespeare isn't necessarily a roadblock, it certainly makes life a lot easier if somebody comes in already able to speak it and make sense of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anyway, yeah, get yeah. off the book and yeah. you can move much higher, much yeah. more quickly. But we've had some great success with people who, uh, who have never done Shakespeare before uh, across all the years of the festival and all of the directors. But uh, so it's, it's, again, I want to stress, it's not a matter of people have to be able to speak Shakespeare. Because if, if you can act, then you can learn Shakespeare. It just makes it a little easier. Uh, yeah. Just like having that relationship already makes it a little easier to, sure. to do your work. Well, and it's the difference between having a real conversation or a small talk. Exactly. In an elevator. You don't want yeah, to do that. Yeah. So uh, the clock is ticking away here. Your <laughs> auditions are? They start Saturday, and uh, they continue all the rest of the week. There's information about that at hawaiishakes.org, which is the Shakespeare website, as well as at the Shakespeare Festival web page, a Facebook page. Facebook page. Yeah. And the shows this year are you're directing uh, I'm directing Othello. Othello. Uh, Eleanor uh, is directing... Um, Winter's Tale and Tony is directing a rep of two Commedia dell'arte mashups of Shakespeare plays. He's taking two plays, mashing them together, and doing that twice. So they'll be alternating these two mash up, mashed up plays. I, I can't remember what his names are, but they're like, you know, a, you know, a Midsummer Night's Hamlet or something. You know, the, that sort of <laughs> that sort of title is what you're going to be seeing. Because Tony there. can't just do it. Tony can't the way just do it everybody the else way does. Anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's transcended the rest of us and moved on to he a just higher has plane. To kick it up. <laughs> um, and and we do want to say that you have already cast your Othello and yeah, your Othello and Iago. Um, Iago. Uh, Othello is uh, Q, who's a local actor of. Uh, of some renown, who I've worked with several times already, and uh, Iago is going to be Sean Forsythe, who I've worked with since, again, since the early 90s. So, uh, like I said, that relationship is already there, and I also know the two of them can handle the language, and uh, we've been, the three of us have been collaborating on this script and this process for two years already, so oh. we're, you know, they'll be the most over-rehearsed actors in the history of the festival <laughs> by the time the show opens. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. They're two awesome actors. They're fabulous. So that's, that's, uh, that's another thing that I always look for when I go to auditions is who else is in the room because yep. those are the people you're going to be spending your life with for the next yep. couple of months at least. Absolutely. Um, okay, we talked about that. Are we good? We're done with good that? Good with that, yeah. Anything you want to say about school? Uh, just, you know, I'm, I work at Mid-Pacific. It's a great school. Uh, you know, we have a tremendous art program uh, across the board there uh, in all sorts of different areas from elementary school all the way through high school. I, I don't have a specific thing to plug, if okay. that's what you mean. because you don't have anything coming uh, up yeah, We're in spring break right now, so we have a lot of stuff coming up late April, early May. Uh, Coco Wheel is directing a Baba Yaga story that will be... Uh, and I'm not pronouncing that right, but that will be playing uh, sometime in May. We have our dance concert coming up, our hula concert coming up, our vocal ensemble and our bands are going to be performing soon, our digital media expo and our uh, annual art gallery show. Tons of art things coming up. Mid-Pacific, yeah. there's always something happening as far as the arts go at Mid-Pacific. Oh, cool. That's yeah, like a good tagline. Yeah, that's um, what we think. <laughs> what's uh, what? The, where should people go to find out about that? Uh, the, the, probably the Mid-Pacific page. I think it's midpac.edu right now. Uh, so we're Mid-Pacific, but the web page is midpac.edu. But we don't use yeah. that shortcut. We, we don't, don't like that. We like, we like Mid-Pacific. Um, so in like three minutes. <laughs> 
Okay. Were you were you always the the kid who was performing when you were young? You know, uh, I was uh, I was the wise ass when I was a kid, uh, and uh, I. I mean, my mouth, I, I've, I'm, you know, it's funny. I, I don't seem it because I've gotten older and the weight has helped with this a lot. But I used to be very angry all the time. Oh. And so I think that a lot of the, the interest I had on being on stage or creating art came from a place of anger. And, uh, and so I was, when I was in college and uh, I came to theater, wanting to write these very didactic uh, attack the attack the government attack I was coming out of the Reagan era so you know attack the government <laughs> attack um, you know Reaganomics uh, and um, that was you know that was me as a 19 20 year old in college and so that was my in into uh, into theater was wanting to write these plays and uh, I auditioned for something and got cast in it and uh, you know I don't think of myself as an actor but I get cast a lot in, in my life and uh and, uh, and I'm just not very good at it. But <laughs> you don't think of yourself as an actor? I, I'm, an I, I, an I'm an actor when I improvise. I think my right. best acting is when I'm improvising. Uh, script work I'm not so good at. And I have a very hard time, I think, uh, uh, finding like an emotional core to what's happening with me. And it's, you know, Scott Rogers uh, explains this, is that a lot of people think their emotions instead of feel their emotions. And that's me. A lot of times these days when I'm, instead of getting angry, I think, wow, I'm rather angry right now. Uh -huh. And uh, and so I think that that weakens my ability to do scripted work. But I think that with improvisation, I have a much more direct line into that. I mean, with improvisation, it's all coming from somewhere in the depths of my id anyways, where all the emotions live, so everything can come out. I have a hard time getting there with a script. Oh. So, and I'm aware of that. Man. I've been working on it. <laughs> I want that script. Give me that script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that time yeah. to, to work on the script. And re yeah, yeah, very but, you know, different. I can improvise and get so into it. That I've improvised that I've gotten so into like a death scene that I've passed out. Yeah? Uh, you know, so it's... It's when I improvise, it's all available to me, and it's uh, the farther I get away from improv, the the more it goes away. So interesting. Yeah. So do you kind of feel like you need it? Need need to improv to have that in your uh, life? You know, it, I, improvisation has become really yeah, it has really become central to my to who I am as a person, uh, and it certainly affects how I approach directing. I mean, I'm a collaborator, and uh, and getting from the point of where I was in the 90s, where it was like, I am in charge, do this and do this and do this, to where I am now, which is much more like, well, I've cast you because I want to see what you bring to this. I don't need you to play this role in a specific way according to my vision. What I want to see is what you're going to bring to it. And uh, for some actors, that's great. And I know that for some actors, that drives them crazy. Uh, do you know Tari, Tari Kinoshita? Mm -hmm. she, uh, she says there are some actors that have this thing like, well, you, the director, do all the research, all the work, tell me how to my, say my lines, and I'll make the tears. Uh, and that's how she characterizes some actors. And, and other actors are the actors who really want to sit down and do all that work. Uh, and uh, I'm not, I, I'm not, I sound like I'm judging, but I'm not really judging either way of approaching acting, but I find that I work better with people that want to bring something. And that's from the improv world. You know, mm -hmm. you want, I want, I'm not, as the director, I'm not the king. I'm the, I'm the first citizen among many, but, uh, you know, I have the veto power, but if somebody comes to me with a better idea than what my idea was, of course I'm going to go with the better idea because I want the show to be great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm working with Amanda Stone uh, on Othello as the AD. Amanda is a local actress, and uh, Amanda's fabulous. But you know, one of the things I learned working with Amanda last year is she's just great at collaboration in that way. She'll come at you, she'll bring 20 ideas to you, and and 19 of them will be exactly right. Yeah, mm. and uh, you know, find someone like that and work with them yeah, and, <laughs> and play. Yeah, and yeah, play yeah, and yeah, figure yeah. out what sticks to the wall. Yeah. Um, I, we have to wrap up. Okay. That, that, this has been a really good conversation. Well, good. Well, thank you. Nice getting to know you. Pleasure to get to know you, too. <laughs> um, HawaiiShakes.org is That's where people right. can find out about the auditions. Yeah. Um, TheArtsAtMarks.org is where people can find out about your performances. Right. Or uh, OTSImprov.org. Thank you. That's uh, 
they, they, they found the website. O OTSimprov.com. Dot com. Okay. A little Thank you. bird told me in my Thank ear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for being here. I'm happy that you joined us on Center Stage this week. I would also like to thank the little bird in my ear, Zuri Bender, who is our, what are, what are we calling her, a studio engineer. She's, she's a goddess, is what she is. I would also like to thank Emily. Thank you very much, our floor manager, Emily, whose last name I don't know because she's not usually my floor manager. What's your last name? Oh, hell, I'm not going to be <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really hear it, did you? Okay. <laughs> and I would also like to thank Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put all of this together. We'll see you next week. Thank you.